You're surviving a conference? Yeah. How many people are not local? So you're dying of time zone issues, jet lag? I know I am. I'm from Canada. That's why I actually I speak French. French is, my French is my first language, but I speak a better French than people in France. It's like Quebec is better French. So, uh, but this is why I have that beautiful accent. Is there any, are you French? <laughs> <laughs> no, you look really offset. I'm like, I, I work at a French-based company, like in Paris, so I just tease them all the time. Uh, most of the time, we understand each other, but seriously, sometimes they're like, Fred, I have no idea what you said. <laughs> what the hell was that? Like, that was French. But, yeah, Quebecois. So, my name is Frédéric Harper. You can call me Fred. And I'm a director of developer relations at MindE. This is a fancy title, but basically, my job is to help developer being successful. And today, I'm going to try to help developer being successful with a non-technical topic. So the topic today is about mental health. Uh, the only thing that's going to be like tech-related to the topic is the title. <laughs> the rest is not specific to uh, tech people. It's not specific for developers. It's good for everyone. But I really think it's important to talk about mental health at a developer conference because it's a problem in any industry, but, you know, in the uh, tech community, we thrive on working late and working a lot, and we're proud of not sleeping, and we don't talk really about mental health, and if you do good for you, that's really good, but we need to talk more about mental health, we need to have mental health being less taboo. So, on that note, I'm turning back to the photographer. So, <laughs> on that note, uh, I want to have my clicker working. There we go. So first thing first, <clears throat> it's not an easy topic. It's not an easy topic, so if you feel triggered at some point, if it's too much for you, please leave the room. Not that I'm kicking you out, but I won't be offended. No hard feeling. Actually, I don't want you to stay if it's too intense. I will try to keep it as light as a talk on mental health be, but uh, if there is anything, please uh, don't stay in the room. So the idea is not to upset people or to trigger people. The idea is to talk more about mental health, trying to make it less taboo. Second thing, I'm not a health professional. I'm a developer, like most people or some people in the room. I'm a tech guy. I have no study when it comes to mental health, when it comes to health overall, as you can see. So uh, I'm a developer, so everything I'm going to say right now is based on what I've read, on my opinion, and my experience. So it does not go, if it goes against what your doctor said or your doctor would say, please don't take my advice. I would assume that mostly everything I'm going to say is okay, but again, just a warning, I'm not a health professional. This is the only other thing that's going to be like a little bit technical. I was like, what can I do for a tech conference for developer if I'm not talking code this time? So I decided to do a little bit geeky with Git, uh, with Git and, and trying to do Ting and Bash just to show my star, which is a little less cool than I thought. No, no, it's not that bad. So basically today, as I said, the idea is I want to share my experience, not to be like, oh, I'm so good, I'm going to talk about this on this stage, more than uh, we need people to talk about that. And the more we talk about mental health, about different issues, the more other people will talk about it, the less that's going to be taboo. And I'm going to try to share some tips if you are in a place where you're not in the right place right now, you're feeling down, or you have friends and family that are not feeling well, I'm going to try to share some tips with you. I'm going to try to, actually, I'm going to be really transparent about what happened in my life, what is happening right now, and I try to reduce my talk, minimize my talk as much as possible to fit in the 50 minutes, so I may not have that much time for a question, but right after the talk, I'm going to be outside. If you have any question whatsoever, there is no taboo question with me. Uh, and if you want to talk to someone, I'm going to be there for you too uh, for the rest of the conference. With that said, one out of four people, adult actually, experience mental illness every year. I'm not going to ask you to look around the room and say like, oh, like there is like a one people out of four that's going to have mental illness because that's the most hack word that like how many people know Java and other don't know Java, but you get a point. And the thing is that one out of 17 people lives with serious mental illness. 
incapabilities, I don't know why I struggle with that word in English, that cause you issues to live your life, basically. That is not just uh, something that is not accommodating, it's really causing you trouble day to day. I'm, uh, I'm terrible for photographer, I move, the, I move a lot. So yeah, that, that, that's a lot. And that is a stat, even living with mental illness, that is a stat that was like, what the? One out of four people. It's one out of, out of what the? I was like, no, seriously. Wow, what the hell? And the reason for that is basically because mental illness is not visible most of the time. Right now, you can look at me, and if I don't tell my, my story, and you see like, oh, this guy worked at that place, worked at the other place, seems happy, I went for drinks with friends yesterday. <coughs> Sorry about that. And you know, like, oh, this guy is great, like he's living uh, the good life. But the truth is, it's not always the case, and I'm not the happiest person on earth. I'm not the worst person on earth. But you know, because it's not visible, we tend to not talk much about it. And you know, there's probably other people in the room that have a mental illness. But if I look in the room, I'm like, yeah, you know what? Everyone is good. Because you don't have something visual, like when you have any physical health issue, or you broke your leg, or you wear glasses. Like, those things are visual. Like, I can say that you, you probably don't have a really good vision. You either, you either. Because we wear glasses, and it's okay. He's not offended. Or Maybe you are, sorry about that. I hope you're not offended because I said like, oh, your vision sucks, man, uh, because you wear glasses. No, it's a normal thing. We wear glasses. Nobody's going to tell you like, hey, you should stop wearing glasses. It's not natural. No, you have problems with your eyes. But mental illness, we don't see it. And because we don't see it, we think we may be alone in that boat or it's hard to talk about it. So let's talk a little bit about my story, my experience, because I love talking about myself. So let's start with uh, attention deficit disorder or hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, which for most people seems like the problem of the century. And it is true, there is more and more kids diagnosed with ADHD than they used to have kids diagnosed with ADHD, and even more adult. And it's true that for some people that are old like me or older, yeah, looking at you. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm going to have so many like, bad reviews. That guy is an asshole. Uh, so, uh, you know, in my time, like, it did not exist. Actually, it was a thing, but nobody were diagnosed, and mostly nobody were diagnosed ADHD when I was a kid at school. I was just a disturbing kid who was not listening, who was not doing his own work, who was not really good at school. But the truth is, I'm not so stupid. I I'm, I'm, guess I'm pretty intelligent. It, but the thing is that, uh, look, actually, intelligent enough to succeed in life. So, okay, we can, we can argue about the intelligent factor for me after that. But, you know, it's just listen to someone, a teacher, about a subject that I don't care and I don't like. It's the worst terrible things in my life. I cannot do that. Doing homework, someone forced me to do work. It's terrible. I cannot do that. So ADHD is really a problem. And this is my mind most of the time. My mind goes to 100 kilometers per hour all the time. And unfortunately, the only two ways I found to stop my mind, actually two ways and a half. The first one is I need to watch TV, but like, no-brainer TV, you know, action, pow, pow, American movie, or a comedy, or something that I do, not need, I do not need my brain. And for whatever reason, my brain turns off when I watch TV. Some other ADHD people I know, they cannot watch TV because it takes too much of their attention, but for me, it works. And the other one is when I'm drunk, which is not a good solution to turn your heads off, which I use a lot in the past. Uh, because that, at some point, it's unterrible to always think about too many things. So, you know, uh, I kind of like went into kind of dark pattern to be able to feel a little bit better, but it was not really good. And the other way is with medication, which I started to take not too long ago after all these years. And even that, it's a work in progress because you need to find the right pills that fit your brain chemistry. You need to find the right dosage that makes sense for you. So now, I can quote-unquote function as a real adult, but it's not perfect yet, but it's really better. So what is ADHD, actually? Everybody seems to know ADHD, but what you're going to see is that maybe we don't know ADHD that much. 
ADHD is characterized by a persistent pattern, or you can all read, <laughs> pattern of notation and or hyperactivity and impulsivity that interferes with functioning or development. You tell me that I was nicer with my accent than you just reading it. So this is ADHD. So everybody is like, when I say to people, I have ADHD, usually the answer I get is like, oh yeah, me too, I forget my keys once in a while. I'm like, yes, maybe. It's ADHD. There's a lot of chance it may not be, because we all forget things once in a while. And ADHD, for me, it's a spectrum. I mean that we're probably all a little bit ADHD. But the problem is when it impacts your day-to-day -day functioning, or if you're a kid, your development to become a full-fledged person, adult. When we talk about ADHD, most of the time it's about the impulsivity or the hyperactivity or the fact that you forgot things or you cannot stay in place, which again, most of us has it. And for me, lucky me, I have the attention deficit disorder plus the hyperactivity plus the impulsivity. That's a great combo in life. So when you talk about ADHD, there is that image that I really love, the iceberg. When we talk, think about trouble focusing, I don't want to say all this focusing, it's focusing. But <laughs> focusing uh, in life, which is why I'm giving the talk. It's why I'm not sitting watching talks when I go to conference. I just speak with people in the hall because like listening to someone, even interesting, it kills me. Uh, I cannot do that. I'm fidgeting also. And the cameraman uh, before just saw it, and the person who is uh, managing the recording have a hard time probably with me, but that's it. This is how I do my talk. I need to move even when I'm talking. So I'm fidgeting. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. This is part of the other things that you can fill with ADHD. And that iceberg that I want to, it's not mine, I found it online, I don't know the source, I tried to find the initial source, cannot find it, but I want to complete it because it's not complete. So that's going to give things that you can even feel, like there is comorbidity with other things. So when you have ADHD, there is a chance that you become depressed. Because you're always in coping, you're always in coping mode, trying to find coping mechanism to be like the society wants you to do. Because the society is made for, is not made for neurodivergent people. It's made for people that don't have those kind of uh, divergence in the brain, that don't have those issues with the chemistry in their brain. You're going to have rejective sensitivity dysphoria, uh, which is a real problem, actually. Uh, you know, it's being really more sensitive to rejection than other people. You're going to have mood swing. Uh, you can poor sense of time. It's terrible. I'm really bad with time. When I was managing a team of developers and I had to evaluate the time we we're, sp were spending on different tasks, that was not good. That was really not good. There was also uh, something called, which I totally forgot, and I hope it's on the iceberg. And of course, it's not. I totally forgot. Anyway, uh, I, oh, I have, you know, about um, time management and memory. I have short term memory issues that is caused by ADHD. So we're going to talk together. Your, talk, your name is Andre? Andre, so did I say, I don't know why I said it with an accent. Is it good? Yeah. Andre, or just Andre? 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 No? Okay, sorry. Uh, I, I just didn't know. So, um, like, you tell, you tell me your name, and uh, we have a discussion, and 30 seconds after, I don't remember your name. So first, I'm really bad with name, and it's not because I don't want to. It's not because I don't care about you. It's just because you just told me something, uh, which, which put me in trouble sometimes. So ADHD is a lot of things, but also it causes comorbidity with other type of mental illness. And this is just the point of the iceberg. And the thing is that there is a lot more people that have ADHD, then we think, and for real, not just people that say like, oh, I forgot my key, so I have ADHD, or people that tell me like, oh no, ADHD does not exist, like I also actually forgot my key, so it's not a real thing, we all forget things once in a while, and we all cannot sit on the seat once in a while, but again, it's how it affects all your life. So, unfortunately, I find mostly stats for the United States, but uh, just in the United States alone, there is 6.1 million 
of children that are diagnosed between 4 and 17 years old with ADHD. And there is 5% of the adult population that have ADHD, which is huge, and it's growing year after year. I got diagnosed about 30 years ago. Uh, no, actually, it's not true. I was 30, about 10 years ago. So I spent 30 years without being diagnosed. It was not a surprise. Like, that was really not a surprise when the doctor was like, okay, yeah, you are. So, and actually, it was not a surprise for everyone in my entourage. Like, my friends, family, they were like, no, no. <laughs> we know it. So thanks, doctor. But uh, that was still good for me to have someone validate that I was not crazy. It, it, I had real issues that were preventing me to do things in life because I have chemistry issues in my brain, because I'm missing some pattern in my brain, which means that, uh, you know, the hormone, uh, the pleasure, uh, hormone of pleasure. When I do something that pleased me, that was not what I wanted to say. When I, I do something that I like, uh, you know, you get satisfaction. You play a game you like, you play a video game, you, you I don't know, you, met the, you meet a friend for a drink or a coffee, and, and it's pleasurable, you like that. You receive, you get, um, what did I say? Dopamine. Say that again? Dopamine. Dopamine, thank you. I like that. Dopamine, you know, <laughs> brain, ADHD. So uh, you get dopamine, and I get less than other people. And my pattern in my brain, doing things that I find boring is way more difficult. How many people as adults find brushing your teeth difficult? One, per, one, people, one person in the room. Actually, I should raise my hand. Like, it's, 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 it's cumbersome, it's, it's like, it's, I need to spend two minutes of my life doing this in my mouth? I don't want to do that. I don't, it's terrible. I, I, I do it, okay? <laughs> so you were like, oh my God, I'm not going to get close to Fred. No, I brush my teeth. But it was a long work to do that, to be, to be honest. Like, when you're a kid, you don't like it because you don't like it. But it continued for me as an adult. So in the morning, I, I was, I'm able to brush my teeth because it's part of a, a process that every morning I do the exact same thing to start my day. And because it's part of that process, like, I go brush my teeth, but even when I brush my teeth, I'm like, fuck. So now what I do is like, I have a part of my, my, my morning routine. While I brush my teeth, I open the, uh, the, the window in my room and I, I place my things to start my day and I brush my teeth. So I do something else while brushing my teeth because it's so boring and, and, and cumbersome for me to do that. And it's just a small example because it's a simple one that everybody can understand. Or actually, maybe not understand, but you understand the point that, like, for me, it's terrible to do those kind of things. Let's go with the less happier topic. Depression, major depressive disorder, persistent depressive disorder, dark thoughts, suicidal thoughts. That is the difficult part of the talk. I'm not happy with myself. It's a luxury. This is how depression starts. You're not happy with something. You just want to get out of your body. And there's different levels of depression. A depression, everybody at some point in their life is going to get depressed. Depressed is kind of like a high sadness. It's a temporary, temporary, mild episode of sadness caused by loss or a medical condition. You lost someone you love to health issue or just for, like, high age, you had a relationship that finished, you lost a job, you're more than sad, you're depressed, it stick with you, but it's temporary. The next step, though, because there is a next step, it's major depressive disorder or major depression, which is characterized by at least two weeks of depression. So two weeks of pervasive, low mood, low self-esteem, loss of interest or pleasure in normally enjoyable activity. This is what I had in 2015. I broke a breakup in a relationship. I was in a relationship with eight years. She left me. I thought she was a woman in my life. Really hit me hard. And thanks to a lot of people that were like, 
Fred, there's other woman in the world, just, just get over it. No, that's not how it's working. I was fucking sad at that time. That was terrible. That was the worst thing that happened in my life. And obviously, in a grand scheme of things, my life is pretty good compared to other people. But for me, at that moment, that was the most terrible thing. So I had bought them. I, I spent, I don't remember, seven to nine months watching Netflix and eating food. Not really good. And some people could say, like, hey, that's nice. Hey, seven, eight months, not working, you watch TV, you eat food. It's nice when you're happy and you're in a good mood. It's not really nice when you're depressed and we, when you're really depressed. I'm a social person. I was not seeing my friends and family. For me, sitting at home, I stayed at home. I, I freaked out at the beginning of the pandemic, like, seriously, I would never have been here like a year ago. Uh, I stay at home for like a year and a half without going out, and I'm not even hypochondriac. I was just like, oh shit, I can die. That's terrible. That thing happened. No matter if you believe in a pandemic or not, or vaccine or not, for me, that was terrible. And it was really hard mentally because I was not able to see people. So just to tell you that when I was depressed, I had no reason to not go see the people Like, in the pandemic, I was like, no, there's a virus. Like, I, I, I mean, I got sick and, and shit like that. But when I was depressed, I just didn't feel like seeing those people. I was not able to do things that I enjoy, because everything was blah. Everything was boring. Everything was sad. Everything was not interesting. The only thing I did was sleeping, Netflix, and eating. But after that, There's another type of depression, which is the persistent depressive disorder, which is basically a depression you have most of, like, all the time, that is uh, referred to, basically, uh, low mood that are lasted at least two years, but may not reach the intensity of major depression. Many people are able to function day to day, but feel less joy and joyless most of the time. So, in my case, I hit bottom in 2015. I stayed like that for about a year, and I started to work again and do a better thing, starting to see a psychi uh, psychologist or a shrink when uh, people say in the U.S., and started to take medication, so that helped me, my mood a little bit. But at one point, I was like, okay, I work on myself, and I'm like, I'm done with the relationship, like, like really done. I mean, I went through my things, I lived through it, I understand the situation. I'm not sad anymore about that breakup. But I was like, fuck, I'm still depressed. And I entered that beautiful phase of first system depressive disorder. And in my case, it's probably caused uh, because of ADHD, because I spent my whole life using coping mechanism to just try to be normal like other people. And it's really tiring. It's really asking me a lot to just kind of like be like everyone else, be like the society, the society wants me to be. But again, I'm functioning. I have a job. I have friends. I have... I was going to say I have a family. I have a family, but I don't have kids. I'm single. But like the rest of my life is going well. So... But there are days, most days, where I'm like, I'm feeling sad, or I feel good now, but I'm going to go back to my hotel room and feeling a little bit sad. You know, that moon is kind of like always there, and that caused trouble in the rest of my life too. So how do you feel depression? Because you feel it. You feel it in your bone, literally. Poor, con poor concentration. And I was like, okay, I'm fucked. I already have that. Like, I don't think it's a good symptom for me. But suicidal thoughts, you don't always have it. But when depression is major, sometimes you're going to reach the suicidal thoughts. And there is different level of having dark thoughts, uh, what I will talk a little more after. You lost joy of pleasure, fatigue, you're always tired. But it's more than just being tired because I didn't sleep well, I went to the bar late. It's, it's fatigue, it's like you have no energy to do things. You withdraw from friends and family, you are irritable. Uh, lack of motivation, headache, muscle, like your muscle aches. Uh, they, they're like stiff, uh, upset stomach, uh, bowel syndrome, weight gain or loss. So it's, it's really one or the other, depending on like how you deal with depression. You either stop eating or you eat too much. You kind of like eat your emotion. And difficulty sleeping, which is really good when you're depressed because you should sleep You should sleep to get better, at least. Uh, feel a little bit better, but you're struggling to sleep because you're depressed. So that's kind of like uh, a, a real bad cycle. And depression, 
or even burnout, is way more, I just have the word popular, but it's not what I mean to, it's way more uh, something that happens in the society than we think. Because again, there is a lot of people depressed that are functioning adult, and even kids, some kids are depressed, that are functioning adult. Or you don't know about this, because maybe they withdrew in their own place for a month or two, but you just thought that, you know, they were doing their stuff, we don't talk that much often, life is good, or they took vacation, or you just don't know because they won't talk to you about that, either because they're ashamed of that, or they just don't feel the energy to do it, or maybe they don't feel that your relationship is at the stage where they can do that, even if it's not true, they feel like it right now. And just in the uh, United States alone, there are 17.7 million adults, or actually people, American, who experience depression per year. And again, it's a number that is growing. I don't want, I, I'm not a phi, uh, philosopher, but I would say society does not help all those mental illness, the way we do things, the, the way we need to be successful at work and family, the, the way we are doing capitalism, things that, like, everything we do, we're stressed with time, we work hard, we need to be successful with social media, there's always someone doing better than us, and now we want to do that, we want to be better, we want to show great pictures of Instagram, where life is amazing. So all those things that we run about, pretty sure it's not helping, but again, not a doctor. But depression brings something even darker, sometimes, not all the time, and I promise this is the last most difficult part of the discussion today, or actually me speaking today. <laughs> but the idea, again, is that when I say society, the, some people were smiling just before, and you stop smiling. Why? Because that's the fucking big word. That is scary. That is frightening. We don't want to talk about that. That is scary. And we are right. That is scary. But because it's scary, because we don't want to talk about this, we need to talk about it. We need to make it less scary. We need to be able to talk about those difficult things. Because when I got major depression, at some point I had societal thoughts. Not an easy thing to say, even right now, and I'm telling those things for years now. I had societal thoughts. I wanted to end my life, because I was like, I'm in the dark. I reached a point where I was like, that's going to be easier to stop with all that shit. And I was lucky in my unluckiness, if I can say, because at one point, I finally decided to go to a bar with a friend, which is probably the worst idea when you're depressed, going, having alcohol, because alcohol is a depressant, or is it the word in English? Depressant? Yeah. So it's, it's not a good idea. But that's the only thing that my friend was able to get me out of the room with, like, okay, let's go for a drink. So I went with a drink with one of my friends, and I drink so much that when I come back home, I just wrote something on Facebook, like, hey, I'm tired of that shit, I'm done. And people known that I was depressed, but I was so drunk, I fell asleep. So I was not even able to, like, go through any plans I had in my mind. But the next morning, someone knocked on my door. Where are the cops? One friend saw on Facebook that I like shit. Fred, like shit is getting real. Like I, I'm, I'm worried about Fred. They called the cops. Cops knocked to my door to know if I was still alive or if I needed help. That changed my life in a good way. I was like, holy shit! I have cops to my door. I'm not used to that. Maybe I look like someone who's used to that with the beard and shaved head. I'm not used to have cops to my door. And I was like, fuck, that, that's the wake-up call. I, I don't want that. Like, it, it doesn't make sense. So I started to, to try to get more help. And again, I don't know if I was going to do the fatal action of, like, removing myself from the society, removing myself from that planet. I don't know if I was going to do it, but I had the idea to do it. And maybe I would have gone through, and I wouldn't be here today. Lucky enough, I was so fucking drunk that I passed away. And that is like one time you can say alcohol was a good thing for me uh, or for anybody, because actually I love alcohol, but like it's not good for us, it's toxic. But I still love it. So yeah, I was lucky to go through that. Uh, the thing is that 
why I'm talking about that. Not so you're like, oh, Fred, you're so good. You passed through this. Like, congratulations. No, I, like, I, I appreciate that, but I I'm not here for that. I'm here because, again, it's a difficult topic. And most of the time, we dismiss those kind of like, thoughts that people are sharing because it's so huge, it's so big, that we're like, nah, it's just a past. Like, it, like, it's just like right now, we feel a little bit depressed, like tomorrow's going to be good, go get some sleep, or next week's going to be good. Or, oh, no, you always, he or she always feel down, he's just a downer. Like, it's, it's, nah, you don't have to worry about that. But what I would ask you, everybody in the room right now, and it's not done, in malice or in, in, in a bad way. It's just like we are, how the society made us, like we, we push those things aside. But let's try to be alert for those kind of like trigger words or those people that are sharing things either in, pers in person, face to face, or at work, or even on social media. Just, just go see people and say like, hey, are you okay? Do you want to talk? And, and there are things that you need to keep in mind, like there is societal thoughts without details. And I'm going to tell you a little bit what that means. I don't want to leave anymore. There is no details. I don't deserve to be on this planet. People would be happier if I wouldn't exist. One day, I'll be done with all that shit. I have no or no more reasons to stay alive. Those are alarming. But what I'm saying, societal thoughts without details, uh, after, when I started to get a little bit better, I volunteered in a suicidal hotline or suicidal helpline, and the helpline was for people with suicidal thoughts to talk to a stranger that would listen to you, or try to find help but don't know how to do it, or people that have friends or family or people they know, or even people they don't know, that goes through a place or that are in a place where they have suicidal thoughts, or people that lost people because of suicide. So we were there to help them, and we have that sheet with different information we needed to take to try to evaluate the person at the other side of the phone. And we had like, you know, green, yellow, uh, orange, red, and depending on the discussion we had with people, if the person had no details about their societal thoughts, it was still important, it was still taking the time with that people, but it was not crisis mode. We're like, okay, there's still time to kind of like bring back the person to a little more reality and trying to help the person find a positive thing and trying to help the person uh, find the help that they need. But when the person had the how, the where, and or the when, that was starting to be a lot more worrying. I would jump off the bridge next to my place tomorrow. There is, there is a really specific place and a specific time. That is fucking worrying. It's a, it's a we try to de-escalate that, or uh, even a case where if it would be like after I hang up, like we try to keep the person on the phone, we call the cops, that this kind of situation. So don't worry to, sorry. <coughs> don't worry to, uh, or actually don't be afraid to, to ask for help. Don't be afraid if you feel that the person is in danger to call 911 or the equivalent of 911 where you live. I don't know what it is here. It's 911? 999? That's cooler than 911. Anyway, uh, so yeah, don't be afraid to call uh, if you need assistance or if you worry that the person is in danger. I just bought a gun. This is the how. I'll show her what she has done to me at her party. I don't know when's the party. Let's say it's in one week. Hey have one week to try to de-escalate that, because maybe that person, the thing is that you don't know. Maybe that person will never do it. My best friend at the beginning was like, yeah, it's just sadness, you know, because we're men, men don't cry, and Fred is always happy, he's the most joyful of us, always like making jokes, like, not Fred. And I love him, and he was, he was so much there for me during all that time, but at the beginning, he was like everyone else. And I don't blame him, because it was like that with other people. Until you live it, it's, it's a little bit harder to understand those kind of things. And I was like that, and I was like, nah, it's just sadness, it's fine. You know, like, tomorrow is going to be good, you're just sad, and whatever. And, and the thing is that when you reach those kind of level, like, take those in consideration. Actually, at any step, depending if you have societal thoughts or not, take what people tell you as soon as it's the truth. I assume it's true, no matter what you know about those people. I have a knife on my bedside table. 
bedside table for when I'll be ready. So there is no when, but you never know when the when's going to be happy, uh, when, when's going to happen. Is when I'll be ready in five minutes or in six years? You don't know, so you don't take chance. Pills, overdose will be the less painful. Again, the way to do that. If you don't come back to me soon, I'll hang myself after a breakup. So those things, that's the worst slides I have. That's not fun to read. That's not fun to me saying those are not fun. But it's just to try to not desensitize people, but again, to try to make those less taboo and trying to be alert for those kind of things. So take everybody that say things about suicide or ending their life seriously, because you never know it's going to be true. And I sure hope you won't take the chance, because you will have a really bad surprise if it's true after. We've got so many people that were calling about like, oh, uh, like he told me that and I did not believe him, or I should have seen the sign. This is a thing where you probably don't see the sign, you will probably not see the sign, but when you see the sign, take actions. Last thing I want to talk about in that joyful talk of today is uh, anxiety or generalized anxiety disorder. All of a sudden, this thing called life happens to me and now I've got to deal with it, which we all do. But anxiety had just a level of anxiety to life. So uh, anxiety, what is general anxiety disorder? It's characterized by persistent and excessive Persistent and excessive anxiety and worry far out of proportion to the actual likelihood of impact of the anticipated event occurring more days than not for the, at least six months. So this is how you're diagnosed-ish about general, generalized anxiety disorder, which is someone who is anxious all the time. We are all anxious at some point in our life. We worry about something that did not happen and may never happen. It's different from stress, where stress, you worry about something that is real. You're in front of a crocodile running toward you. It's not anxiety. Like, it can go away with your, <laughs> with your arm. That is stress. Anxiety is worrying about your manager schedule one-on-one uh, -on -one with you on a Friday without giving you any details. Oh my God, I'm going to lose my job. Even if everything is going well at work. I never known anxiety before I had my major depression. And now, voila, something more adding to the special souls that made me. So uh, that was a new thing for me. And now I live with that. I'm anxious most of the time, and it just doesn't make sense for me to be anxious. I don't understand the fact that I'm being anxious. But there is something somewhere in my brain, probably, as I said, comorbidity with depression, maybe related to ADHD, that trigger anxiety on me. And anxiety is a bitch because we evolve in many, many ways as humans, but our brain did not evolve that much for multiple things. When we were cavemen, cavewoman, like if I had, like I had a reaction that is called uh, fear of flight, or yeah, fear of flight, which, no, sorry, fight or flight, sorry, thank you. Fight or flight reaction, which was like super important because there is a lion coming through me. <laughs> I need to run. And to be able to run and escape the lion because it's a life or death situation, my body will react in a different way. I'm going to have a better vision. Uh, my organ, some of my organs will stop working. So every energy goes to the heart, to the, my muscles, so I can run faster. My heart's going to pump to the maximum because I need the lot of juice to be able to run away or fight that monster that is coming to kill me because I'm going to be his dinner. So that fight or flight, yeah, I got it right this time, that fight or flight situation is what you feel when you've got anxiety because the brain is like, oh my God, your boss is going to want to talk to you, you're going to die, that's the end of the world. So your body reacts like if you had a disaster coming in front of you and you're really going to die, like that's terrible. The things that happened many, many, many years ago, so your brain reacts the same way for totally stupid things. Things that are out of proportion, that does not happen most of the time. And that can have serious condition. Uh, you can reach the point where you have anxiety attack or called panic attack, where you basically feel like you have a heart attack. I've done it once, the first time. I didn't know it was a panic attack. 
I thought I was dying, and I was sweating. I'm sweating right now, but I'm good. It's just hot. I was sweating. My heart was like everything I said before. My vision was blurry. I was a little bit like uh, dizzy. I was sweating a lot.、Uh, my heart was pumping. I had、uh, pain in my chest. My muscle was super sore, and I was like, "That's it. That's it. I'm doing a heart attack." Especially because I have high blood pressure and I'm not super thin, I was like, "Okay, now my life of not taking care of myself is coming back to me." So I called an ambulance. I went to the hospital, and good for me, it was not a heart attack. I did not feel like I was not dying at that time. I thought I was dying, and that happened closely two, three times. I'm gonna destroy everything. That happened two, three times after, but I was in a place where. I know it was that, so I was able to kind of like calm myself with some mechanism that I developed about that. But it's really not fun. But the thing is that, of course, the panic attack or、uh, anxiety attack is not fun. But always being anxious about things that you should not worry at all about is not fun either. And there is a lot more people that have anxiety than we think. So I'm not going to go through all those symptoms, but it's basically one of some of the things I said. Sweating, trembling, feeling weak, gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal problems, having difficulty controlling worry.、Uh, those are all signs of being anxious and panic attack. It's just that panic attack is the next level of those same tones. So every morning when I wake up, I have that ball in the chest, and I just wake up. Nothing is threatening my life. I'm just worried all the time, which is super annoying because it was not the case a couple of years ago. So I lived through that, and hopefully the medication I take for depression helps for anxiety. So now it's just a little bit of pain in the chest. It's kind of like not fun, but it's not the end of the world. And with different other things that I'm doing right now, I am able to manage it most of the time. But it's still always there, like you know that little thing on my. Shoulder that is like, hey, shit's gonna hit the fan, Fred. Like it's it's not a good state. But there is a lot more people that have anxiety than we think. Just in the U.S. only, nearly 20 percent of adults sounds better than 18.1. Nearly 20 percent of adults have anxiety, and it's only a stat for the U.S. So I assume that other places it's close to that, or maybe some other places where lifestyle is a little more. Easy, it's a little more、uh, less stressful. May have less anxiety, but still, it's a problem. And again, so it's another thing that's gonna that is growing in terms of number, because people get more and more anxious because we're being asked to do more things in life, to be more things, more different aspects of our life. We always need to do more, do better. So people get more stressed, but also get more anxious. So with that said. How can you help yourself in those situations? How can you help other people? So first, this is the sign you were looking for. If you don't feel good right now, if you have people around you that don't feel good, if it's related to the mental health issues disorder that I talk about, or the diversion,、uh, neurodivergence that I talk like ADHD,、uh, this is the time to think about yourself first. You need to be. Egoist for that. You need to start thinking about yourself first, because if you're not in a good spot, you're not going to be able to help other people. You're not going to be able to help the people you love. So think about yourself first. Be egocentric. Be egoist about your mental health. Start with yourself first. Self-care is in selfish. It's good to take time for yourself. It's good to take times to do things that you like. It's good to do what makes you happy, because mental health is super important, and you won't know it's important until you have mental health issue that affect your life. And at that point, you're going to be like, "Oh yeah, I should have taken more care of myself if it was possible or not." When you're not feeling good, call a friend. That that's the first tip I'm going to say. Call someone, a friend or a family member that you feel comfortable enough to talk about how you're feeling. Talking about how you feel is the biggest、uh, the biggest tips that I can tell you. And if you don't want to talk to friends because it's too difficult, because you're ashamed, because you're not ready to do that,、uh, or maybe actually I forgot this one, but you can meet friends if you're able to get out of your place. 
meet people, hug your friend, maybe if you, even if you're not a hugger, just the physical contact with someone you love, like platonic physical contact with someone you love, is, is, is firing uh, the pleasure hormone, is giving you a ah, sentiment that is really needed when you don't feel good. But if you don't feel like talking to your friend, this is the phone number for uh, the Suicide Prevention Helpline in the UK. Call that number. People won't judge you in the line. It's their job. You can talk to them. You can say everything you have to say, everything you want to share. They are trained to do that. And if you don't live in the UK or you have people that don't live in the UK, seriously, Wikipedia is the right place to go. Uh, there's a list of suicide, cri suicide crisis lines. Uh, you go, you search uh, crisis or suicidal hotline or suicidal helpline on Google, or you go on Wikipedia, bit.ly, crisis, crisis numbers, and you're going to have a list of different countries. Disconnect from social media and internet. Because it's as much as I spend too much time on Twitter and I love it, uh, it may change the future for different reasons, but uh, as much as I love Twitter right now, uh, or spend a lot of time on internet since forever, it's not always good. I do a lot of, uh, how do you call that, like doom scrolling when you just scroll, 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 and sometimes I'm like, oh shit, it's, it's, it's like midnight, and I wanted to go to bed at 10, but I was just scrolling. Or always seeing people that share good things about their life on social media, you get that, that syndrome like you want to keep with the Jonas, or the Jones and uh, the Jones and the Jonas. Like, you know, you want to do with like other people. You're like, oh, my life sucks. Like, this person is again in Bali uh, doing whatever in clear water. And like, oh, I want to do that. My life sucks. Like, I went to New York yesterday. <laughs> like, it's not as exciting. Sorry for people in New York. It's a nice city, but it's not Bali. Uh, so disconnect. Try to breathe. Just breathe. Just, just, it looks stupid, but like, just stop. Take a deep breath and look on the internet for breathing exercise. That makes wonder. Like, you would not believe how something as stupid as breathing, but still super important, because, hey, I need breathing to live, is fundamental of, like, lowering, lowering the stress, lowering the anxiety. Try to meditate. Oh, yeah, I'm not into that yoga shit and thing. Like, I'm not a hippie. You don't need to. Uh, meditation, even for five minutes a day, uh, you will see a change. If you don't know how to meditate, look on the internet. Uh, there, is, there are ways to meditate, and there are different ways to meditate, and certainly that's going to help you. I meditate about... I was not super good recently for the last couple of months, but usually I meditate between 30 minutes and one hour per day, and that really, really, really helped me. And yes, that intense. You don't have to do that. Five minutes is enough. Uh, go outside. I just love that image. Like, I know it's not really nature, but like, just go outside, go nature. And if you don't feel like going outside in nature, or if you live in a place where there is no real nature, just go on your balcony or just put a step outside. Having fresh air or quote unquote fresh air and live in the city, that's still going to be better than just breathing the air inside of your place. So that's going to help you. You go with small steps. And at some point, maybe you're going to be good to go to a park and have like real nature, but like go step by step, just going outside, breathing some fresh air, this is going to be helpful. Listen to music, not music that makes you down, something with the beat, something you like, something that makes you dance, dance, dancing is nice. Like I, I'm not going to go dance because I, I dance like shit, but uh, you know, music will help you uh, elevate your mood. Humans are really receptive to sounds, to music, so listen to music that's going to help you. Try to do something fun. Try to do something you like. And if you're in a space where there is nothing you like because you're depressed, there is all the other tips that could work for you. But try to remember what I used to like. And maybe if you're able to force yourself to try to do that, and maybe you're going to enjoy it like you used to before you were depressed. Adapt the animal. Seriously, adopt a cat or adopt 10 cats. Just keep them after. Don't buy animals, adopt them, uh, because there's a lot of cats or, or other animals that nobody cares about that can be adopted. But cats, cats are really important. I'm a crazy cat man, you can adopt dogs too. But seriously, having an animal, it brings you so much joy. And as I said before, I, I freaked out at the beginning of the pandemic. And having a cat at home, because I was living alone, really helped me. And maybe I was that crazy cat man who was talking to his cat, and like, I still talk to my cat. But that really helped me to have a little something, uh, a, a ball of love uh, that was living with me. So having animals can really help you. 
Talk to a psychologist. Talk to a professional about your mental health. There is a lot more people that go to psychologists or a shrink, even if they don't have any mental issue. Talking to a stranger that won't judge you, just trying to do your laundry of bad things that are happening in your life, is really nice. If you can afford it, it's really really nice. Talk to a health professional. You know, those are the ones going to be able to prescribe you medication. Those are the ones going to be able to uh, help you. To find the right resources for you, and taking medication is okay. You can take medication. It's like it's not. People tell me like, "Oh, you should not take medication.、Uh, it's not natural. Oh, you're going to be stuck with this for the rest of your life." Again, do you say that to someone with glasses or someone who had like a, a cast under their leg? Like, "Oh no, you should just walk on your leg. Like, it's broken. It's not. It's like just walk on it. It's okay." No. So take medication. That's going to help you. And you know what? Fake it until you make it. That sounds like the stupidest tip, but if you fake being happy at some point, hopefully, maybe you're gonna start being happier because your brain's gonna be working on that faking being happy. So I'm out of time, but I want to quickly say a fuck to mental health taboo and stigmas. Really quickly, people don't talk about those because it's the stigma, it's taboo. We're ashamed of that. So talk about those that you're a fucking lion. You're the king and the queen of the jungle, just to be alive and have a live and living right now and living through shit. And even if you don't live through shit, you are a fucking king and queen、uh, to do that. I got that on Twitter recently、uh, on a thread. Another one, someone's like, "Hey,、uh, anxiety, just just deny it. That's the only way to get cured. Like, just face your anxiety." Thank you, genius. I never thought about that. You solve the world hunger problem. I don't know. Like people still acting like shit like that. So it's why we need to talk about anxiety.、Uh, again, you wouldn't say that to someone like this. Take pills. I'm gonna say it again. You should take pills if you need to, either temporarily to help you go through the phase to try to get better, or for the rest of your life. Who cares? You need that. Fine. You need that compared to other people who need other stuff to make your live. And men can be sad. Boys can cry. I didn't talk about mental health at the beginning because I was ashamed. I'm a man. I'm a strong man. Men don't cry. Like no, that's the fucking toxic masculinity bullshit. Men can be sad too. So on that note, the word did not explode where we were here. I'm totally out of time. I want to be respectful for the next speaker. But thanks for being in that room. Thanks for taking the time. Please talk to other people about mental health. Please listen to other people because the more we do, the more we talk about it. The more we listen, the less is going to be taboo. The more people is going to be able to talk about it. So on that note, I hope and I really ask you: Are you? How are you right now? And if you're not feeling good, come talk to me. I'm going to be there. So that's it. Thanks for being here. You're awesome. And have a more、uh, joyful rest of the conference. But again, thanks for being here and、uh, listen to mental health and、uh, talk about that because it's people like you that's going to help us to remove the taboo around that. So have a good one.